Warning, this video contains spoilers for the entirety of Hunter x Hunter's Chimera Ant arc. If you prefer to read along, there's a link to the corresponding post on my blog in the description, and without further ado, enjoy. Narration is something easily taken for granted. Usually it's just there to provide background information, stuff we need to know in order to understand what's going on without turning the characters into walking exposition machines. A narrator arms the audience with knowledge, and they synthesize and interpret it accordingly. However, this is the bare minimum of what a narrator is capable of. By manipulating when and how one uses narration, a sea of possibilities opens to the storyteller, allowing them to elevate their work to a level not otherwise possible. The Khmer Ant arc of Hunter x Hunter is often decried by many an anime viewer for its extensive use of narration, with the narrator seemingly joining the cast along for the ride. But rather than take this as a fault, I'd argue that this narration style is what elevates the Khmer Ant arc among the higher echelons of its brethren. Hunter x Hunter utilizes this narrator as a playwright employs prose, enveloping the Khmer Ant arc in an air of dramatic tension and epicness in every sense of the word, as well as improving understanding understandability in both its themes and plotlines. Throughout the beginning of the Chimera Ant arc, the narrator is pretty typical. The majority of his input is through summary, exposition, and knowledge that the average person living in the Hunter x Hunter universe would know, and thus things that would be unnatural for the characters to mention. His usage is also usually relegated to the beginnings and ends of episodes, interjecting only every once in a while otherwise. His main job is to establish the setting and summarize past events so that we're able to get our bearings as the arc establishes itself. For everything else, the characters interact among themselves, leaking important information along the way. For example, Kite is the one to reveal the seemingly unassuming antagonist for which the arc is named, and his reaction clues the viewer in on what to expect more elegantly, Sans narrator. The audience is given the privilege of being in the same position as Gon and Killua. Whisked away with the help of a company, they find themselves in a new, unfamiliar situation with a foe they know little to nothing about. By easing up on the narration, the audience is given time to formulate their own thoughts and theories about events to come. And as the arc continues and the audience is privy to just how vicious of an enemy the Chimera Ants are, dramatic tension builds because we know just what Gon and friends are in for. But over time, the narrator helps himself to more and more liberties. Expanding from simple exposition, he chimes in to punctuate key points and expand on others. Eventually, he begins to reveal information beyond the scope of common knowledge. One of the early turning points of narration is the introduction of Jairo's backstory. From the teaser at the end of the previous episode, one might expect this shadowy ruler to be shrouded in mystery, some mental bubblegum for the viewer to chew on throughout the arc. Imagine the surprise when the first half of the next episode is devoted to explicitly describing how this individual came to be. Togashi deliberately spells it out for the viewer because in this instance he wants to remove all speculation. He sacrifices the air of mystery, but in turn is able to set the tone for the entire arc. Before the flashback, the audience's view of Gyro could be any number of things, from cocky goofy drug lord to calculating mob boss, but this image crystallizes into something concrete post-flashback. Now we understand Gyro as a former abused child who feels at odds with the universe, going as far as declaring his inhumanity. We also learn the principle of which he based the founding of an entire country upon, which proposes an interesting question that the narrator leaves with us at the end of the episode. This usage of the narrator to steer the audience on course returns later in the arc, and is helpful as a way to drive points home. By presenting Gyro in this way, the viewer is able to focus on what is happening rather than what could be baseless speculation, and the themes of humanity versus inhumanity are made more apparent. Dramatic tension continues to climb as well when the audience considers the implications of the narrator's question. Speaking of questions, this also marks the beginning of the narrator almost losing his objectivity, broaching speculative questions rather than just presenting clear facts. The narrator also maintains a timeline for the benefit of the viewer. He notifies the audience the timing of crucial events such as the hatching of the Royal Guard and the days leading up to the selection. It seems like a minor thing at first, but during later events this is extremely important as more pieces and players get added and more things happen simultaneously. At the same time, the narrator plays a diminished role after the gyro reveal, allowing dramatic scenes to speak for themselves. One of the criticisms viewers have of the Hunter x Hunter narrator is redundancy, but he knows when to back off to increase the emotional impact of a scene. In some episodes of the Knuckle and Shoot training section, he isn't anywhere to be found at all, with brief recaps serving as summary and characters free to make their own proclamations to the camera. The narrator returns in full force when Killua ends up having to deal with the Ortho siblings. Escaping from the beginnings and ends of episodes, the narration picks up halfway after the male sibling makes a curious remark. Here the narrator fully explains just what the Ortho sibling's power entails for a reason similar to the Gyro flashback. Togashi wants to drive home Killua's helplessness as well as the Ortho sibling's risk. By doing so, Killua's eventual victory over them is that much sweeter because we know just how powerful of an ability he's facing and just how few limitations it has. However, this descriptive narration is delayed in order to fully place the audience in Killua's panicked mindset. We get the best of both worlds, the confusion and speculation that comes with being blindsided by such an ability and the realization of the stakes when it becomes fully explained. We also get an explanation of how Kilo was able to overcome their ability, clearly laying out his clever use of Nen. Togashi is once again making sure things are absolutely certain in the minds of the viewer, using narration as a tool to do so. Nen is a remarkably versatile power system that manages to be simple and extremely complex at the same time. It is due to this that Togashi takes it upon himself to delineate the ins and outs of each character's ability. From the Ortho siblings on, he describes the abilities of Morel, Nov, Chitsu, Leal, and so on. 
Having everything be clear in the mind of the viewer is incredibly important when it comes to something like Nen, because even though it seemingly follows carefully laid out rules and restrictions, its variety branches forth more than lightning. What we the viewer get out of this is an increased appreciation for both Nen and the creativity of the characters who use it in staggeringly inventive ways. Hunter x Hunter is obsessed with supplying its audience with knowledge for them to do with it what they will. A lot of this knowledge is brought to us by the narrator. In fact, the narrator seems to become a character of his own within the Chimera Ant arc, presenting information in a markedly biased manner as well as abusing his omniscience. The introduction of Kamugi, for instance, is absolutely steeped in foreshadowing. In combination with his constant explanation of things, this reflects his usage as a medium for literary devices. Drama and dramatic irony are created when the audience knows things that the characters do not, and ramps up tension and emotional impact. When Nov infiltrates the palace in preparation for the invasion, we find ourselves on the edge of our seats because Nov has no idea that this is his absolute best chance to succeed. But it is not until the arc's pivotal turning point that the narration crescendos into a resounding forte, the palace invasion. Before we delve into the meaningness that is the palace invasion, let's review what the narrator has done so far. He's provided exposition and setting as well as common background knowledge. He's articulated the backstory of a character, Jayo's ideals and motivations. He's wholly explained several Nen abilities. He's managed the timeline of crucial events, and he's become less objective as time goes on, punctuating key or humorous moments. Go Freaks, 12 Sai B Gata, Hobo Muriari, Palm Siberia, 22 Sai A Gata, to Tsukiyau Koto ni Nari, Shiranu Ma ni Furare. With his own interjections, as well as blatantly foreshadowing future events. All of the actions of the narrator thus far become even more pronounced after the palace invasion, and he becomes a driving force for the narrative. This is necessary due to the nature of the invasion, but in addition to that, this narrative flair brings a far greater emotional payoff to events in the arc with the narrator's eloquence and timing. The palace invasion kicks off in episode 111, and by episode 117, the narrator informs us that only a whopping three in-universe minutes have passed. At first, this seems absurd considering the viewers watch more than two hours of content, but at the heart of this is the reason for the necessity of the narrator. From the instant the invasion starts to where we find ourselves in episode 117, countless important events and storylines have commenced and branched seemingly exponentially. In addition to this, the very mention of the time passing tints the events of the last six episodes in an epic light, reframing the happenings in a way where the audience is able to feel the massive scale and grandness of what's going on. A incomplete list of characters we follow the thoughts and actions of from episodes 111 to 117 in no particular order include Gone. Kilowa, Knuckles, Shoot, Morel, Ikago, Welfin, Bravada, Poof, Pito, Yupi, Meleron, Zeno, Netero, Meruem, and so on and so on. Throughout the arc, multiple storylines develop simultaneously and begin to intertwine with one another, such as when Morel reunites with Knuckle and when Kilowa runs into Palm. In order to adequately ground the viewer and prevent confusion, the narrator acts as a sort of guide, slowing down time and jumping back and forth between plot lines to provide a mental map as to what is happening and what times. While controlling time, the narrator also seemingly takes control of the camera. He'll be explaining something and suddenly mention new developments as they come into frame, while the camera will cut to them as they happen. In fact, the narrator becomes almost similar to a director, managing shots and withholding information out of frame until they become relevant. What this all comes back to is knowledge. Hunter x Hunter's narrator is the king of context, and through this context our enjoyment of the series is improved. Context is able to give more emotional weight to events and the motivations behind our favorite characters. In the episode where the palace invasion starts, the narrator brings to our attention that the only reason Pito notices Netero and Zeno is pure instinct and chance. In episode 112, we're given more insight into Shoot's character, and a little later his and Knuckles' relationship, making Knuckles' determination to save face for him and his friend hit all the more harder. In episode 121, the narrator informs us with his omniscience that the most optimal solution for Yuppie to take would have been to kill Morel, Knuckle, and Meleron on the spot. Consequentially, we understand the gravity of Yuppie's newfound respect more thoroughly. And just before that, Morel makes a hasty decision to see Smokey Jail, but we learn by doing so he's able to arrive just in time to support Knuckle, and that he does this purely subconsciously out of experience. I can only describe the feeling that these moments of context bring as epic. Through all the knowledge we're so graciously given, we're able to appreciate just how grand and impactful everything happening is. And not only that, but once again, this accomplishes something that Togashi sought from the beginning, to drive points home. We're able to watch Yupi as a character transform and sift through the complex emotions rolling under the surface. And as a consequence, we sort of understand when Knuckles says he can no longer see Yupi as an enemy because he and Ant showed them humanity. The narrator is used in this way to change our perspectives and expectations and deliver thematic payloads. For example, at the end of the arc, he provides us information regarding the true Digo's whereabouts, how he had left Iskorto to an imposter. On the surface, there's really no reason to tell us this other than interesting minutia acting as filler, but dig a little deeper and this seemingly small tidbit of information serves a greater thematic purpose. Digo, like Laertes in Shakespeare's Hamlet, acts as a foil to Meruan. Because while Merom starts out life brash and eager to assert his power, he eventually recognizes something that Digo knew from the beginning. 
that true power comes with living a life that you choose for yourself. Part of the reason why the Khmer Ant arc has this air of epicness is due to its narrative style. It shares similarities to the epic poems of old, the Beowulfs and Odysseys you've all read in English class. I mentioned above that Hunter Hunter's narrator acts as a medium for literary devices, almost as if his words were actually text read aloud. In episode 119, he sets up an obvious Chekhov's gun that is fired to great effect a bit later, and he utilizes poignant metaphors and sets up more foreshadowing throughout the arc. Toward the end, he frames himself as a representative of humanity as a whole, proclaiming the member words, We're far worse. The idea that one should show, not tell, seems like an obvious rule of writing today, but in the past, this guideline was actually taken as a sign of poor writing. Friedrich Spielhagen, the German novelist, argued that only a detailed description of characters, events, and actions is in accordance with the laws of the epic, and hence should be rated superior. Instead of show don't tell, you could say that Hunter Hunter embraces a kindergartner's ideology. Show and tell. There are a number of scenes that demonstrate the usefulness and benefit of the narrator. Netero's entrance and backstory, the description of Yuppie's inner turmoil, and of course the spectacular reveal of the poor man's rose. But the episode I feel most encapsulates how well the narrator is used is when Kilua confronts Palm. In the beginning, the narrator brings our attention to Palm, and then Kilua is able to think out what his reaction to her should be. After suspicion comes across to the audience, and Palm goes crazy, the narrator explains her ability, allowing us to understand Kilua's own worry about the situation. Kilua then shifts his focus from attacking to trying to have a discussion with Palm, to which the narrator informs informs us of his true intentions. However, it is due to this that makes Kilua's eventual breakdown all the more powerful, because we know that he was just trying to buy time but couldn't keep his doubts and insecurities about Gon from escaping. From here, Palm pauses a moment before defying Poof, prompting the narrator to explain the events that were hidden to us previously, about exactly what happened to Palm all those episodes ago. And it is due to this that we get context about how Palm is able to turn coat easier than the other ants, as well as their creator's actions, and the experimentation that Pizzo and Poof were performing. This scene really shows how the narrator strikes a balance between show and tell, providing context when it enhances the episode and backing off to allow emotion to take the spotlight, which is what the narrator does consistently throughout Hunter x Hunter. Some would argue that the narrator's job is to be invisible. Hunter x Hunter says otherwise. But of course this is just what I think. What did you think about the narrator? Unnecessary? Epic? Hamfisted? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and be sure to subscribe and like the video for more content. And of course, if anything I said was wrong, I'm sorry. I must have stuttered.